views of the Breton Harbor of Brest, largest anchorage in Europe and most important U-boat base in France, near the close of the 28-day siege ending 20th September. A field artillery battery brings forward an 8-inch gun on 11th September to fire point-blank at the massive wall surrounding the fortress where Nazi paratroop General Hermann Bernard Ramke is offering bitter resistance. city be continued until surrender, P-47s of the 9th Air Force dive bomb Nazi installations and remnants of an estimated original garrison of 20,000. The Germans resisted fanatically. General Ramke had told them, every soldier marching against us is one threat less against the homeland. Demolitions by the Nazis supplemented damage to railroad yards and docks from American air and land bombardment. American infantrymen take up positions in a captured strong point overlooking the waterfront. A tank destroyer goes into action. Snipers had held up progress through this street before arrival of the armored vehicle. Equipped with Bangalore torpedoes, a demolition squad sets out to reduce German pillboxes still blocking a general entry into the city on 11th September. The Nazis demolish docks and submarine pens as the siege nears its end. At Beaugency, 18 miles southwest of Orleans, France, approximately 20,000 German troops are surrendered by their commander, Major General Eric Elster. The capitulation is accepted by Major General Robert C. Macon, commander of the U.S. 83rd Division. General Elster, General, General Elster, sir, is uh, retired to. Uh, over the surrender of his command. Herr General, nachdem die obere Führung durch die Kriegslage gezwungen, meiner Marschgruppe die kampffähigen Verbände. Before surrendering, General Elster proposed four conditions. Three were accepted. One, that full honors be accorded to his troops, including the right to retain their arms until reaching Beaugency. Two, that he and his staff be treated separately. Three, that all negotiations be carried out with Americans. The fourth proposal, which was rejected, was that a token battle take place before the surrender. General Elster hands over his pistol as a token of surrender. General Elster, acting for the commanding general of the 9th United States Army, Lieutenant General William H. Simpson, and on behalf of the Army of the United States, I accept your surrender. You, your officers, and men will be given treatment in accordance with the principles of the Geneva Convention. General. General Elster commanded the Biarritz area from the Pyrenees Mountains to the Bay of Biscay. Under him were nearly 20,000 Wehrmacht, Luftwaffe, and Marine troops now converging on Beaugency to give up their arms and equipment. Their position was helpless. They were isolated hundreds of miles behind the Allied lines, menaced by French forces of the interior and the 9th Air Force. They marched from the area above Chateau Neuf, south of the town of Romorantin. It was near Romorantin that a young officer, Lieutenant Samuel W. McGill first received word of Elster's desire to surrender. 
500 trucks and 400 commandeered civilian cars are in the caravan. One thousand horses and wagons used by the Nazis in the retreat to the Loire River. During the Blitzkrieg, it was not unusual to see 20,000 men surrender at once, but it's something new to the Germans that they should be the ones to surrender in such numbers. Two thousand bicycles were among the surrendered equipment. The surrender march lasts throughout the day, an Allied victory accomplished without the loss of a single American soldier. Arriving at Beaugency, the horses and vehicles are placed in enclosures. Regimental colors are disposed of before the Nazi troops file in to lay down their arms. They surrender a vast amount of rifles and pistols. In addition to their personal arms and ammunition, the prisoners brought in dozens of ACAC guns and 4,500 machine guns. Entering the prisoner of war compound. The exact count is 19,360 men, the largest single group of Nazis to surrender in southwestern France. Aerial views of the prisoner pens. To date, the six Allied armies in Western Europe have captured at least 526,000 Nazis. flying bomb launching sites along the rocket coast near the Pas de Calais and Flanders. The ramp, resembling a ski run, is 50 yards long with rails about a yard apart. Between the rails are two covers of half-inch steel with a three-quarter inch center groove. Below the covers is a tube for inserting a piston which propels the buzz bombs during takeoff. This sketch, based on a photograph taken by Allied flyers, indicates the aerial torpedoes are brought from three loading and assembly lines marked A to the launching ramp marked B. The ramp is distinguished by flare scars, evidence of the employment of rockets for the initial takeoffs. Tracks leading to the launching ramp are marked C. A power line marked D is shown by the faint shadow of long poles. Launching points of recent construction were ingeniously concealed and camouflaged. Further substantiation of the use of the piston principle for releasing the flying bomb. Canadian troops inspect a ramp which is designed to mount a 400-pound piston of the type shown here. The piston is equipped with a flange which runs between the two covers on the ramp and fits behind a similar flange on the bottom of the bomb. Once inserted, the piston is forced down the tube by compressed air, providing the initial thrust to get the bomb airborne. The piston is self-jettisoned 400 yards from the ramp.
These apparently are remote controls for the launching. The set was operated by the Nazis at a spot where they believed they'd be least vulnerable to the many hazards of the takeoffs. The jet nozzle assembly, into which is forced a combination of synthetic gasoline and compressed oxygen. A spark plug ignites the mixture, which drives the jet propulsion engine. Ordinarily, the capacity of the gas tank allows for about 300 miles of flight. The bomb drops when the fuel is exhausted. A firing pistol sets off the explosive. Compressed air bottles supply power for the gyro pilot, which utilizes this control box for maintaining planned direction, altitude, and distance of flight. Servo motors linked with this mechanism move the rudders and elevators. An unexploded warhead contains the explosive for the flying bomb. The component parts are mounted as shown in the diagram. The flying bomb is approximately 25 feet long with a 16-foot wing spread. The flame jet issuing from the rear propels the robot in a series of explosive jerks, attaining speeds of up to 400 miles per hour. This launching site was attacked by 500 Allied bombers. One explosion blew a block of concrete 30 feet up onto the limb of a tree. Today, the rocket coast is strewn with the rubble of bombed out assembly points. Patton's troops forge bridgeheads over the Moselle, south of Metz. For the first time, the Third Army makes tactical use of mechanical smoke generators to screen its operations. On 12th September, a chemical smoke company lays down a thick screen which conceals the crossing of a span near the village of Arnville, France. Concentrations of Nazi infantry, armor, and artillery face the Third Army between the Moselle and the West Wall. Almost at the same time, there's a junction of the 3rd and 7th Army troops northwest of Dijon. 28 days after the landings in southern France, contact is established between forward elements of General Patch's army and the right flank of General Patton's forces. Drive from France into Belgium of the British Second Army under Lieutenant General Sir Miles Dempsey. Advancing 60 miles in 36 hours, the Tommies crossed the border east of Lille, taking Tournay, 3rd September. From here, the British spread out west to reach Ghent, where Belgian patriots helped to clean up sniper groups. Collaborators leave the courthouse for internment. Ghent is the heart of the Belgian floral industry and one of the great railway and canal centers of Europe. A British armored division follows its commander into the liberated city. Other troops push north toward Antwerp and enter the burning city 4th September. The Germans still dominate the approaches to the great port, which in peacetime handled more than 20 million tons of cargo a year. Street fighting continues along the streets of Antwerp.
rounding up Nazi defenders as the Second Army spearheads towards Holland. Sweeping all the way across Luxembourg, the First Army breaches enemy defenses before the Reich. In the German town of Wollendorf, a captured pillbox displays a sign that says Hitler has personally inspected this fortification. Bollendorf is still afire from Allied shellings. Crossings of the German frontier from Luxembourg were made on 11th September. D plus 97. The campaign to turn the vaunted Siegfried Line brings the war to German soil for the first time since the autumn of 1939. The second surge into Germany in less than 24 hours is made from southeastern Belgium. Troops push past Montteur en route to the border. After crossing the Windischfelser River, the infantry company makes its way up a hill into Germany. They enter Germany proper near the town of Emer. Entry into Germany at a point above Eupen on 12th September. At 14.55 hours, the border town of Rutgen is occupied. The white flag is prominently displayed within Rutgen. Crossing the border of the Greater Reich is established in 1940 near Bayo. The adjacent town of Malrange is deserted. Its population is 70% German. There were no welcoming crowds. The fast Allied drive across Belgium was aided to a great extent by the Belgian White Army. They light beacon fires to direct dropping by parachute of airborne supplies. Airfields cannot be spared and speed is essential. These resistant troops must be armed to assist in mopping up rear guard Nazis and to patrol vital lines of communications. White Army troops scan the skies as approaching planes are heard. The aircraft are British Sterlings. They are loaded down with guns and ammunition which were packed in special containers for the parachute landing. German occupation, the arms were brought into the fields at night. This is the first daylight landing of supplies. Parachutes are carefully rolled and will be returned to England. The White Army uses every available means of transportation to rush supplies to distribution depots. in England for the airborne operations of 17th September. The first Allied airborne army under Lieutenant General Lewis H. Brereton is ready to take off from scores of fields to invade the Rhine Delta of the Netherlands. The forces participating in the largest assault of its kind are the U.S. 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, veterans of the D-Day landings in Normandy, also the British 1st Airborne Division. 
The paratroopers are loaded into hundreds of C-47 transports. They were preceded by a vast fleet of bombers and fighters which softened up the Dutch invasion area. takes off toward the English Channel and heads for Holland. Landings are scheduled to be made north of Eindhoven, southeast of Nijmegen, and west of Arnhem. On English airfields, gliders are lined up to receive their assigned troops. This particular group constitutes a signal company. They'll be responsible for establishing a division command post and setting up a communication system. At H 140 minutes, they'll land in Holland slightly north of the town of Zahn. Last minute instructions are issued as they await the takeoffs. The gliders, towed by C-47s, carry field tanks, hospital equipment, and numerous items necessary for a self-contained army. the channel. The vast inundated plains of Holland, where Nazis opened the dikes to provide barriers against land invasion. The airborne attack is aimed at the rivers of the Netherlands that form a natural protective front for the weakest part of fortress Germany. Reaching a point near Eindhoven, the gliders cut away from the tow planes and come down for the landing. The airborne troops quickly consolidate their initial objectives. Entering the town of Zahn, 18th September.